Well, welcome to the, the Summer Institute. I know this is your first experience of these people. And the... Uh, <laughs> Seems like a friendly crowd. Well, they're all right. They, br they bring their own blessings okay. and their own challenges, so and that's as it should be. But it's a pleasure to, to be able to spend some time with you and to talk about things that are very important. We're going to be talking about mental health issues and various things that surround that. So I think most people in this room will have some knowledge, experience, and certainly a good deal of interest. So it's going to be good. So what we're going to do is Kay and I will talk for maybe 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to the floor for for questions. So, to kick off, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you managed to get into mental health issues? Mm. Yeah, my, my journey into mental health ministry was not something I sought or wanted. I was, um, I was really happy with my life the way it was. Um, I'd been an advocate for people, a global advocate for people living with HIV and AIDS and for orphans for about a decade and really meaningful work to me. Traveled around the world, speaking up for, for people um, on the margins, um, for orphans, um, encouraging churches to become welcoming places. I, I loved my life, I really did. And then my 27-year-old um, son, Matthew, um, took his life on April 5th, 2013. And I knew in an instant that my life had radically changed forever for so many reasons, but I also knew instantly that my years of being an advocate for people with HIV and for orphans had ended. Right. And that I would, I knew that I would shift my advocacy towards um, people living with mental illness because Matthew had been mentally ill almost his entire life. And um, it would shift to that and around suicide awareness mm -hmm. and prevention. And I, obviously I didn't want that. Yeah. I wasn't. That wasn't a ministry I wanted. It, I, would, I was very happy with what I was doing. I felt effective. I felt God used me. I felt like he was using my gifts. I felt um, like it was effective. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't stay on that path. It's like my life path had just gotten blown up in front of me, and God just, in that moment, thrust me onto a whole different pathway. That's interesting. Yeah. And HIV... As much as I had loved working um, for and with people with HIV and for orphans, and had cried, I mean, my God broke my heart about yeah. the HIV pandemic um, in 2002. So, I mean, my heart had been broken by that. But it wasn't personal to me. I wasn't HIV positive. Um, no one in my family was yeah. HIV positive. I wasn't an orphan. We didn't have, I mean, passionate, but it wasn't personal. Yeah. And um, when my son took his life, it could not have been more personal. It yeah. became the most intimate yeah. pain I'd ever experienced. And so I come to this work from the deepest place of pain yeah. and the most personal place of pain. Um, and it is, it's really sacred work. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'd like to talk to you about your, your son's uh, mm -hmm. mental health issues and his suicide. But before that, because it's interesting what you're saying, because sometimes we think that vocation is a single thing that is given to us and lasts forever. For your lifetime, yeah. But it sounds to me as if you're seeing vocation as something that is for a season. I think it can be. Right. I, I, I do know there are people who start in one thing and do that their entire lives. Um, but there are, I think, maybe many more of us who um, God changes and shifts things through the years, through the seasons. Yeah. And that's always difficult because we, we want to grab onto what we know and love and it's very difficult. He, he has to pry our you know, fingers yeah. off of that to shift us into something else. Because I imagine that would be quite encouraging for some people who maybe feel that they haven't achieved their vocation or the thing that they wanted mm -hmm. uh, didn't happen. Because uh, you're saying that actually, even though the thing you want didn't happen, something positive comes out of that. Something, something even more than positive. God has, you know, that's probably jumping way ahead of the story, but but God has definitely brought beauty, mm -hmm. you know, from these terrible ashes yeah. of yeah. my son's death. And, um, and I would not have chosen yeah. this work. I liked what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. But God had, um, it's, it, I see it through the lens of him redeeming, yeah. you know. Uh, not that, because I don't believe for a second that God caused Matthew's death. And I don't believe that for a heartbeat. But I do believe that God has definitely used Matthew's death. Right. So, how did you cope? Mm -hmm. How did you cope with losing the son in a situation like that? I'm still figuring out that question. It's yeah. been four years. <clears throat> I, 
I think that at first I couldn't even breathe. I, I felt like probably the best thing I did on any given day for a while was just breathe. Mm -hmm. Because you, when you go through catastrophic loss, um, you don't even necessarily remember to breathe. Right. You, you find that you're, you know, you're breathing way up here in your chest because you're, you're so you know, overcome right. with emotion and shock and trauma and, and sorrow. And, and, and then when somebody says, breathe, take a deep breath, you kind of go, oh. And you don't even realize that you're not even breathing. Yeah. Um, so just breathing, getting up and brushing my teeth. I mean, hygiene didn't matter. I'd say the, the, the shorter answer is um, I became quickly aware that I was going to have to take care of myself in every dimension. That um, clearly I was going to have to do some very hard grief work. Um, I had some work to do with God because I was pretty angry. Yeah. Um, very angry, in fact. Yeah. Uh, because I had believed God was going to heal Matthew here. I was pretty certain. I'd put out the fleece, you know, the whole thing, had the fleece. Right. And, and I'm not really a fleece person, but right. I did a fleece, you know. And, you know, when you're desperate, you'll do anything. And I was so desperate for God to save Matthew, and I felt like God had answered. And so I was all in. Mm -hmm. And then Matthew died. Mm -hmm. um, so I had, to, I had to rebuild hope. My hope was crushed. Um, our whole family changed, the dynamics within our family. Um, you know, he was, your family is like a constellation, yeah. you know, and everybody's got their little orbit of where it is in the family. Yeah. And when one of the planets is suddenly not there, sudden, the whole constellation of our family shifted. Um, so my faith was shifted, our family was shifted. Um, who were the people I could count on, the relationships that I would have said I counted on? Some were there, some weren't. Yeah. So everything, it was like, yeah. just this gen, I don't know if they play this in, you know, started to say Sweden, that would be the wrong country. Sweden, they, they do lots of things in Sweden. <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> Scotland, but an S, S word came to mind, and so I was going to say, I don't know if they do this in Scotland, is what I was trying to say, but they're, forgive me, I'm so sorry. I forgive um, you. I know you're a proud <laughs> Scottish man. Precisely. But, um, Emphasis on the man. Man, yes. <laughs> They warned me about you. I just want you to know. Did they? Yes, they did. Walking in, they warned me about you. But it, here we play this game called fruit basket turnover, and it's you know you throw everything up in the air and you see where the fruit is going to land and what lands on the table and what lands on the ground. And that's what it felt like our lives had happened. It's that God had just played yeah. fruit basket turnover with our lives, and I didn't know what was going to land on the table, what was going to fall off the table, never to be seen again. Yeah. So there was just a lot. So I had to go after. I had to figure out how to go through this grief on every level, spiritually, yeah. and my relationships, practically. Um, I was so tired. You know, I didn't care what happened on the world stage, politics, world events. It didn't matter. No. It really, I didn't even turn the TV on for a month. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Yeah. So just figuring all that out, it's a very long, slow journey. There's no laid out little pathway that you get on it and you know at year one you feel this and at year two you feel this and at year three you feel this. No, you know, oh, if only grief were yeah. a linear journey. Yeah. It's more like a giant plate of spaghetti. It's ins and outs and yeah. you feel this and then you feel that and then you feel, but wait, I felt that yesterday. Shouldn't I not, I don't want to feel that anymore, but I, I feel it again. And yeah. it's the hardest work I've ever done. Yeah. The hardest work I've ever I done. I can well imagine that. Uh, do you think it's okay for Christians to be angry with God? Absolutely. Yeah. All I have to do is open your Bible and see lots of people that got angry at God. Yeah. I mean, the psalmist is a prime example. Uh, you know, Job pretty well called God to task. It was like, you need to come and sit here right now and explain yourself to me, God. Yeah. You know, I mean, God dealt with him and told him, excuse me, sir, I'm God and you're not. That's right. But, but, but he didn't strike him dead. He, he allowed Job to be angry. He allowed the psalmist to be angry. He allowed Jesus to beg him. You know, isn't there some other way we can get this yeah. done? Do, do we have to do it this way? Lots of anger, lots of anger in, in the word. So why do you think Christians find it difficult to be angry with God? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, I think we get afraid that he's going to, lightning will hit us, you know, that he'll pay us back. You know, we got angry. Well, he knows how to take care of that. You know, you have get a car accident or you get cancer. or I mean, that's the way we think God works. Yeah. So we think he'll get back at us. And I think also there's been a, we, we have that, um, we know we're supposed to respect him and honor him. 
And that gets frightening to think of, it feels disrespectful, mm -hmm. you know, it feels um, dishonoring. I think that, well, we don't know what to do with anger anyway. Yeah. We don't even, let alone get angry at God. Yeah. You know, we have a hard time acknowledging that we're angry with each other sometimes, yeah. let alone mad at God. Yeah. Um, it's in, it is interesting because, as I was saying when we spoke earlier, in the church that I go to, this is a good church, but we, we like to be happy. Like, so we find it really difficult to be angry or to be sad or to, to grieve yeah. because we kind of feel guilty, well, partly because we're Scottish and Scottish people kind of thrive in guilt. It's a Calvinist thing. If you're guilty, you're really saved. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, um, when, it, when you, you say to people, Christians, it's okay to, to grieve loudly and to grieve and to express your pain angrily, it can be quite difficult. Yeah, they don't always, people don't always know what to do with that. And, um, but Rick and I have felt that we had, we didn't, obviously we didn't ask for this loss. We begged that it not happen, but it did happen. And as leaders in our church, we felt like that we, we needed to, we needed to, we didn't feel the pressure to, what am I trying to say? We knew we needed to lead well, that right. we needed to lead our congregation well. We needed to show a watching world how you can love Jesus and be mad at the same time. So we didn't feel the pressure to perform, we didn't feel the pressure to be perfect in that, but we did understand that there was a responsibility, that people were gonna watch us. Yeah. They were gonna see how do, how, do, how do Christians live their faith out when the bottom has fallen out, when they've lost a child. And um, so we just kinda knew that with each other that when we spoke and we, we taught at our church, that we were gonna express all of those emotions. And, and it was so raw, I mean, it was four, we came back to the pulpit four months after Matthew died. We, were, we didn't even go to church for four months um, because we couldn't. Yeah. It, it wasn't that we were so mad at God that we couldn't, it's just we couldn't handle the, the pressure of people, everybody wanting to see us and talk to us, and we just couldn't. Yeah. Um, but when we did come back, we did a series called Getting Through What You're Going Through, and um, we were, had this heightened awareness that People need to know that they can be upset, that they can grieve, that they can yeah. mourn, and they can mourn loudly, and they can beat their fists on yeah. God's chest. And um, my thing is, I've always just tried to say, is run to God, not away from Him. Right. You, uh, God can handle truly any emotion I can give Him, but I, I can visualize myself running up to Jesus and pounding on His chest, just pounding on His chest, yeah. sometimes with frustration, sometimes with the, wait, my son, Died. Mm -hmm. This wasn't supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Where were you? What happened? How did this? How can this be? And I see myself just pounding on his chest. Yeah. But I also, at the same time, know that 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 his arms are encircling me. Yeah. That it's a safe place to be angry. It's a safe place to mourn. It's a safe place to question. Yeah. It's a safe place to say, "Man, I don't get you, God. Yeah. I don't get your will. I don't yeah. understand it, and it hurts." Yeah. Like, that's a very beautiful and healing image, actually. I think we should all think about that. The, um, but I suppose the added complication with, with Matthew would be the fact that he took his own life, yeah. which obviously is, is difficult full stop. But within the church, there are all sorts of complicated beliefs around that. Did you find the Christians supportive? Were there issues that emerged that were difficult? I would say, by and large, I mean, we, we feel incredibly blessed with, the, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who sent us messages, cards, phone calls, letters, emails. I mean, to this day, people maybe who meet me for the first time sometimes will say, I just want you to know that for the last four years, I've been praying for you and your family. And that touches my heart yeah. so deeply. So by and large, people have been incredibly supportive to us. Um, there have been, you know, a few people that I would have thought would have been there for us and they weren't. Right. And I don't have, I, I don't know what it says, but it, whatever reason they couldn't engage. And then there have been a few people who have used our son's death as clubs against us. Right. Not even so much in the church as much as it is um, sometimes people not in the church who anything they've disagreed yeah. with my husband about, they've used that as a weapon. Yeah. Well, if you had done this, your son would still be alive. Well, it's your son, um, um, well, you know the reason that your son killed himself is because he's gay, right? I mean, he wasn't, but they just, they say sure. cruel things. It's like, so in other words, it's your fault. Um, 
there was, I got one one day. I, I, I've trained myself a long time ago not to read on the internet things people say about us. Right. That's just an exercise in my blood pressure going up. Yeah. And, you know, it hurts. Yeah. And, it, and I can't yeah. do anything about it. I can't defend myself. So I've just learned not to read it. But one day, for some reason, I thought it was a positive message. And so I started, I clicked on it. Well, it turned out it was somebody who said, well, if you had, if you had homeschooled Matthew. Oh, all right. If you had homeschooled Matthew, if you had never let him play a video game in his life, if he had really lived a purpose-driven life, if his dad had really taught him about the purpose-driven life, if you had never put him on any kind of medication, if you, and it went through this whole list of things, he would be alive today. Right. And my first reaction, I mean, I, it was like somebody had just slapped me. I mean, it was shock. I just kind of pulled back in shock from that. And I had this thought of, I want to kill you. <laughs> How dare you talk to me like this? Yeah. And then I just started laughing because it was so ludicrous. Yeah. Where, where do you even begin to answer something like that? There, there is no answer. And so all I could do was laugh at the absurdity of that. So, you know, by and large, people have been really good. There have been a few cruel people. Yeah. But I really also feel like that we got the best of Christians' responses. Because I talked to a lot of people who did not receive it no. the way, I mean, they've been treated very differently. Yeah. They're in smaller churches or smaller towns or in different places. And actually, people have been quite yeah. cruel. Either they haven't known what to say and they've said nothing at all, so they just suffer in silence, or they're made to feel extreme shame, mm -hmm. that they should feel ashamed mm -hmm. that, that their loved one died by suicide. Um, and then a few people who have also been told, uh, well, you know your loved one's not in heaven, right? Yeah. You do understand that you'll never see your loved one again. Um, and that breaks my heart, yeah. breaks my heart. And so actually one of the greatest joys I have now, it sounds weird, but is to be able to talk to families who, whose loved one was a believer in Jesus um, and to be able to say, no, 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 they, yeah. your loved one, is with Jesus. John 10, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. They're, they're in my hand and nobody can pluck them out of my hand. And, and some people say, oh, but what if you, you know, your loved one took himself out of Jesus' hand? I'm like, I'm sorry. That is just simply not possible. Jesus said, no one can pluck you out of my hand. Yeah. So Jesus has got, Jesus had Matthew in a tight grip. And Romans 8, 28, where, where Paul says, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities, nor things to come, or things present. There's nothing that can separate. And so to be able to reassure people, if your loved one knew Jesus, yeah. and he caught them. He caught her. He caught, he caught my Matthew when he died. Mm -hmm. Before Matthew's body hit the ground, mm -hmm. it was already in the arms of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's safe there. Mm -hmm. He's safe. That's a good place. That's a great frame because I, I imagine there'll be people be. in this room who wrestle with that either through Absolutely. personal experience or otherwise. So Absolutely. that's a very, very beautiful response. So thank mm. you for that. And that probably takes us into the, the whole realm of how you managed to move from that experience, a focus on suicide and whether that means, into mental health issues. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the transition into mental health. They are actually, yeah, like I said, I knew from the very beginning that God was shifting my advocacy. And um, for probably the first year, I didn't do a lot because I just couldn't. I couldn't. It was just, I was getting through a day. And so I was in this awkward phase of, I, I couldn't do the thing that I had been doing because my heart wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't quite yet ready to do the thing where my heart was leading me because I simply didn't have the emotional or spiritual capacity yet yeah. to do it. So it's been a process over these four years of me gradually learning what I can do, how much energy I do have, where I can you know, reach out to other families. But John, since the day Matthew died, I hear from somebody who's either suicidal, has lost someone to suicide, or a parent who's lost a child, or someone who's living with mental illness. It is daily, yeah. daily. And it's not unusual now, I was counting up a couple of weeks ago, um, the direct contact that I had, I had direct, I mean like text contact sure. with um, four families who had lost someone to suicide 
and this was in one week. So in one week, I was talking to four families who had lost someone to suicide in the last month. I was talking to two suicidal young men who were chronically suicidal. I was talking to a mother who had lost um, a young child to murder. And I was talking to three families who had children who had severe mental illness and they didn't know. This was in one wow. week. I'm having wow. direct either text, or email, or phone conversation. Yeah. And that's not unusual. Yeah. That is the way my life is now. And I've learned, I'm learning what I can do, what I can't do. I've learned when it's getting too heavy and I've got to pull back because I have to allow space for my own grief. Mm -hmm. And um, it's all, it's just all learning. I, I'm just figuring it out. I can do more at four years than I could at two years. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be able to do even other things and more at six, seven, <gasps> ten years. Yeah. I don't it, know. It sounds, I mean, it sounds like you, uh, you through your narrative, through your, who you are, you've opened up space where people can find or give voice to things that they're not able, to, haven't been able to do before. And that's a, that's a very powerful and important space, but it's pretty draining, I imagine. It is, but it's also healing. Mm -hmm. It's hard work, it's healing work. I mean, just sitting here talking to you tonight it will be hard on my drive home. Mm -hmm. I have an hour drive home, and I'll sit in the car, I won't drive. My, my friend who came with me will drive me because on my way home tonight, I will be exhausted yeah. to talk so deeply and openly and personally of, of the greatest loss in my life takes a toll. Yeah. And there'll probably be people that I'll talk to afterwards and they'll tell me something about their story, which I wanna hear. And even that will take something of energy from mm -hmm. me, of, of emotional energy. Um, but it's both very painful it's also very healing because I hear things sometimes like people will come up after I've maybe done a whole talk on suicide prevention or awareness and tell Matthew's story. And when people come up to me and say, I just want you to know I've been thinking of taking my life. Not because I really want to die. I just want the pain to stop. Mm -hmm. But I've heard your story. I heard Matthew's story. And I just want you to know I'm taking suicide off the table. Right. I'll find another. I will find a way to live yeah. in this life, but I'm taking suicide. I don't want to do that to my family. I don't want to do that to yeah. my friends. I don't want to end. I don't. I'll find a way. Well, my goodness, it's cost me so much to tell Matthew's story. It's cost me so much to stand there and talk to somebody else knowing they're on the edge of suicide, but to know that there is something life-giving that came out of that. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Yeah, well, it's I'll do it. It's certainly a cross-shaped ministry, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. And what, what the enemy has meant for evil, mm -hmm. God has allowed for good, the saving of many mm -hmm. lives. Genesis 50, 20. So if what the enemy meant to destroy me, mm -hmm. meant to destroy our family, meant to destroy our ministry, meant to destroy my beautiful boy, um, God is using to bring life mm -hmm. and beauty and healing to other people. Mm -hmm. And so, that's his way. That yeah. is his way. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll do it. So in relation to mental illness or mental health challenges or however way people, it's, a, it's like a minefield of uh, terminology. It's complicated. Yeah. But I, what I've noticed in the way that you articulate it is that you see it very much as an illness mm. in the same way as other things, physical illness might be. Uh, whereas others would see it as a challenge. Yeah. Why do you think it's an illness? Or why do you use the language of illness? Um, well, I've, you know, I'm not a mental health professional. I've had to, I started it, you know, what I knew was I was a mom who had a child who was mentally ill. So I had our own personal experience, but I didn't really know that much about mental health. I, I'm still, there's so much I'm learning. Yeah. And in that process of, of learning, understanding how much mental illness is, um, you know, the brain is, is you, Mental illness is part of a brain. The brain doesn't function right in some way. And um, I think that's important because if you think of it as a challenge, then you can look at someone with a mental illness and go, would you just shape up? Would you just shape up already? Come on, try harder. A few more verses, a few more Bible studies. If you would just confess that sin, if you would just, you know, we'll have a prayer meeting for you and we'll get this all figured out. If, if we look at it as a challenge, that leaves people who, would we do that if you had thyroid? I mean, I've got low thyroid. You're not gonna sit here and tell me, Kate, try harder. 
Actually, try I will, harder. I well, you might, but these kind of folks no, would not. They have compassion. They would not. I'm going to talk to you and not to him. <laughs> we don't do that to people when they have cancer. I mean, I've had cancer. People didn't look at me and say, just try harder. Try. You know, if you have a broken wing, telling the bird to fly isn't going to make it fly. Yeah. It isn't going to fly until the wing is, is healed. And so we are a whole. We are, we are whole beings, body, soul, spirit. And if something goes wrong in the brain, it's going to affect the rest of the body. If something goes wrong, we're, we're whole. And so for me, um, I mean, there's the scientific basis that they're coming up with more and more research showing how there's, you know, brain illnesses. There's a neurobiological um, aspect to so, so much of mental illness. I think if you leave it in that behavior category where it sat for such a long time, sure. um, it creates such shame in yeah. people who are trying hard. Yeah. who want their lives to be different, who wish, I could wish that my thyroid would perform correctly from here until, you know, the day I die. It's not going to make my thyroid perform correctly. Mm -hmm. It needs some help. Yeah. So if my brain isn't working quite right, it needs some help. And there's no shame in that. No, it's interesting because, I mean, one of the um, uh, two things, one of the things that's most difficult in terms of mental uh, health issues is stigma. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that, uh, well, what stigma does, it, it emerges originally from the slave trade where the, the trader would buy mm -hmm. a slave and put a mark in it and then you're reduced to the size of that, right. slave, that mark. Uh, and stigma functions in exactly that way. I've gone off. I know, I hear that. No, 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 no. They told me there's one under your chair if you need it. Oh, did they? But it sounds like oh, it came back, back on. Oh. That's the you just need to be more consistent. <laughs> That's <laughs> <the> <laughs> You, uh, you'll fit in well around here. That's right. <laughs> and so stigma, I mean, as soon as you, you have any kind of label of mental health, it takes over your whole life. And, right. and, there. and all these negative comments, and you get spiritual stigma that does the same thing, right. and it's, it's demonic or whatever you want to write. But part of what you seem to be saying is... Uh, Consistency is I such know, a good thing. I, I, have Bra <laughs> I have my good friend Brian Brock laughing before anybody else did. <laughs> Part of what you're saying, and this is, this is relevant, I think, for uh, some of the conversations we have here, is that a medical diagnosis can actually destigmatize certain things. It can take away negative connotations right. of uh, being caused by a demon or caused by a spiritual mm -hmm. warfare or caused by something that you've done and place it in a category that actually right. helps the person right. to frame things positively. Right. So one of the conversations that goes on in, in the Summer Institute is whether or not the, the medical model is, is a terrible thing or, or it's a social model. But you seem to be indicating that actually possibly both models are helpful. It feels like both work together because we are a whole. And I'm so glad you brought this up at this particular moment because I can tell people, and I, you can, he just closed, he doesn't have to hear this, but honestly his book on mental illness and the church um, resurrecting the person has shaped my ministry. And it came along um, about two years after Matthew died. I, I came across your book and um, one of the things that you said, so if anybody's influenced me in, in shaping some of my philosophy or approach to what the church can do for people living with mental illness is so much of what I have learned from you. But you say in there that um, it was just this beautiful way. I mean, it's all highlighted and asterisk and all this stuff because you said if we, if we, if we say that uh, you know, a person has a mental illness, and we put the emphasis on illness. A person has a mental illness. We instantly think of, oh, well, then we need to involve medical mm -hmm. professionals. This person has an illness. So, of course, medical professionals should be involved here. But then you twist it a little bit and you say, but if you put the emphasis on, oh, here is a person who has a mental illness, then suddenly those of us who are Christ followers in the church can go, oh, this is where I belong. That's right. Because here's a person who has an illness. And... So I would say I think it's both because I think people sometimes have an illness that yeah. needs medical help. At the same time, at the very basis, it's a person who has a mental illness. Yeah. And I, I really thank you for the way that you articulated that in that book because it has shaped the way I approach yeah. caring yeah. for people living with mental illness. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I <laughs> So you seem to think that he was being sarcastic No, there, I wasn't right? being sarcastic. Right? I thought he was being genuine, and you all read that was, as sarcasm. No, I was, I was being they genuine. They know you better they, than they, I they do. They don't know me at all. They, they, <laughs> they don't understand how humble I am. <laughs> 
So I, what I'd, I'd like to, to, to focus on before we open up for questions is um, in relation to what you think people can actually do. I, I'm going to take a liberty here and, and uh, read a little bit of the, the vision that you shared mm. uh, recently uh, uh, in relation to mental health and, and the church. Uh, and it runs like this. It's, in my mind's eye, I pictured the worship centre at Saddleback full of people who are living with a mental illness, depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, an eating disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, hopefully not on the same person, because that'd be, that would be a, a hard load, or any other mental illness that was making life challenging. <coughs> um, everyone in the room was reaching out to God without having to pretend that the life felt okay. Some people were crying, others wrapped themselves around a large wooden cross, some were praying, some were offering hugs to others, but all felt safe to bring their pain and their sorrow to God. Then I saw laughter, the kind of laughter that comes when others walking a, a, a similar life path talk about the shared common ups and downs as well as the downs. The moment of absurdity and humour in living with a mental illness. In my vision, hope began to rise. I think it's a really, really powerful vision. And my question to you is, how do we do that? Well, um, Saddleback is a large church, and so it's easy for people from the outside to look in and say, well, of course your church can have a very active and vibrant ministry to people living with mental illness because you're a big church. You've got money, you've got staff, you've got buildings, you've got you know, all these advantages of ways that you could care for people. And so I wanted to fight against that. I wanted to put it down, you know, the cookies on the bottom shelf to say, Yes, we are a big church, but, but there's something that every church can do, whether you're five people in a house church or 50 or 100, whatever. There, there are things, there, in fact, there are six things, I think, that every church can do. And uh, we, we do acrostics at Saddleback. Everything has an acrostic. It just, I'm sorry, it's just the way my, we, we think. My husband has infected me, and I think that way too now. Um, he's the... He's the uh, acrostic king. But so we made one um, using the word church. And so the first C from that if, um, is that every church can make a decision mm -hmm. to care for and support people living with mental illness. It, it doesn't cost any money to care. Yeah. That's where we get caught. We think that we have to spend all this money to show care for people. No, it's a decision of the heart. Yeah. It's a decision. It's, it's recognizing what God has called us to in his word. If we're going to be his followers, this is the way we have to act and behave. So we make a decision that we're going to be a congregation that cares cares for people who live with mental illness. That in itself would radically change the face of mental illness in the world, just to know that a congregation was welcoming and safe and embracing. That, that would change people's lives dramatically. Well, then the H in that, the first H, is to help with practical needs. Every church can help other people with practical needs. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, people brought us meals. They brought our family meals. They offered to take me to treatment. They offered to take me to doctor visits. They offered to take care of my children. They, they, they came in and helped in a practical mm -hmm. way. Well, if somebody in your congregation or mine this week is diagnosed with bipolar disorder, it's not likely that somebody is gonna say, listen, can I bring you a meal tonight? Yeah. Can I take you to your doctor visit? Can I watch your kids? Maybe you need an afternoon, you know, you just need some quiet time. Yeah. And so we don't dive in in those practical ways, but every church can do that, yeah. can help with practical needs. The U is to utilize volunteers. Every church, no matter what size, has people in it who have been called to be ministers of the gospel. Not all pastors, but yeah. everyone is a minister. And so every person has a way they can volunteer to do something um, with their time for people living with mental illness. The R is to remove the stigma. No. Again, the two most powerful things are is to decide that we're going to be a caring congregation. And then the second is to remove the stigma. You've talked about it. I, I encounter it when I, when I traveled the world and um, was an advocate for people with HIV. I got used to people coming up to me and whispering in my ear, I'm HIV positive or I'm living with AIDS. And they whispered it because the stigma... Yeah. You could lose your life. You could you could lose your family. You could people would not want yeah. you to be at their church. I mean, all sorts of terrible things can happen when people disclose they're HIV positive. But I wasn't prepared for now that I'm an advocate for people with mental illness. People come up and whisper in my ear, but this time they whisper, "I have an eating disorder. 
Right. I am living with bipolar disorder. I have schizophrenia. I have borderline personality disorder. I, I am, I am I'm living with depression. And they whisper it for the exact same reason. The mm -hmm. stigma is powerful mm -hmm. and, it, and it hurts. And so when a church, when a pastor stands up in front of a congregation and says, today in our congregation there are people here living with depression and i just want you to know that that it's not a sin to be sick yep. and god loves you and right now in the prayer that we're going to do together as a congregation i'm going to pray for those of you that are living with depression those of you that are living with anxiety the first time rick did that a woman came up to him on the on the patio afterwards and grabbed his arm and said i never thought that my depression would be mentioned in church and yeah. that you cared enough about me to pray for me. The stigma yeah. starts to evaporate. We start knocking down the stigma a brick at a time when we speak it, when we have yeah. people living with mental illness stand and say, and you start going, you're just like me. That's right. So remove the stigma. The second C is to collaborate with the community. The church is not the only solution to this, but the church has its role to play. But the community uh -huh. Us. It's your, it's your, there we go. The community has information that the church doesn't have. So if you don't know much about mental illness, all right, that's okay, because there are so many people in your community that do. Right. So bring them. Bring a doctor. Bring a mental health professional. Bring somebody and speak to your congregation and, and start educating people about it. That's simple to do. Mm -hmm. And then the last H is to offer hope. Because um, there's... <laughs> it's <a> very... <laughs> large moth <laughs> by those lights. Um, <laughs> really big moth. Um, it's really not the medical community's job to offer hope. It's not really the government's job to offer hope, but it is the Church of Jesus Christ's job. It's our job number one, yeah, is to offer right. hope. And so when we, so many people living with mental illness, and especially those who I think probably also maybe have a substance use disorder, so if mm -hmm. you get you know, both you know, addiction and mental illness, and they burn bridges. They yeah. burn bridges with relationships. Right. And you can start to feel like there's no place left on earth yeah. where you really fit. And so when the Church of Jesus Christ becomes that place where you fit, then we offer hope. I, w I would close my part on what I would say. I mean, may well, sorry, you may have another question. No, no, no. I, okay, keep going close there. Away. Okay, okay. <laughs> close away. Um, we've, we've built um, a teaching tool that we call the Hope Circle. And the hope circle is sort of a journey toward hope for people living with mental illness. Because hope is a bit of a dangerous word. Yeah. You know, how many, times, how many times did I hear Matthew say, Mom, you keep telling me this doctor is the doctor, this medication, right. this school program, this treatment. How many times can you tell me that and it doesn't change? Yeah. And so he didn't believe anymore that there was hope. And so the hope circle is... It's, it's a journey toward hope, not a destination. Mm -hmm. But what I heard, it's built on the things I heard my son say. He said to me for years, I hate myself. I hate myself. So much self-loathing and shame. And the hope circle says, but hope says you are loved. Right. Hope and God say you are loved. I heard him say, my, my life doesn't have any meaning. Really, there's no meaning. And hope says, you have a purpose. I heard him say, I don't fit. Sometimes in the deepest parts of his despair, he would say, I don't even fit in the human race. Right. It's not even like I just don't fit here with this group of people. I don't even fit in the human race. Yeah. Is there anything more yeah. painful than feeling like you don't belong to the human race? Mm -hmm. And hope says, no, you belong in the family of God. There is a place for you. He would say, um, I'm done. I am done. I'm out of here. And hope says, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. You didn't choose to have mental illness, but within this, you can choose to stay. You can choose to try one more day. You can choose to get healthy. You can choose to get sober. You can choose to take your medication. He was supposed to take medication. You can choose to go with your friends. To, I mean, there are choices within that. You have a choice. And then I always heard him say, I don't have anything to offer, really. I don't have. He's got these great gifts. She's got, I've got nothing. And hope says, you are needed. Your story is needed. Well, when the church gives that message, yeah. none of those things cost money. It doesn't cost money to be a caring congregation. It doesn't take money to take somebody a meal. It doesn't cost money to train volunteers. It doesn't cost money to remove the stigma. It doesn't cost money to ask somebody from the community to come in. It doesn't cost money to offer hope. Yeah. Every church, every church, can do that. That is within the reach of every congregation. Yeah. Well, I think that's a fantastic 
mm. wait f finish our conversation. It's okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Well, just put your hand up if you've, if you've got a question. We can work out the logistics. This is probably the simplest way. If you can't get out over a few questions, I thank you for coming and having a conversation with that guy. That's right. Um, I'm interested in your um, thoughts on the new Netflix documentary, 13 Reasons. Um, and if you see that as further exacerbating kind of a valorization of suicide, of course, there's been a lot of criticism right. in uh, popular culture about that and if it should be taken off or whatnot. And if this is going to motivate people with or without mental illness to start writing their letters to say, I, I told you so. You know. no. So I'm interested in, in your perspective on that. If you've seen that or if you've seen that. Um, I read the book. Um, and I watched one of the episodes. Um, I, uh, one of the gals in my office saw the whole um, series, and she warned me that the last three episodes that she didn't advise me to watch because they were so graphic. Um, so I, I read the book, and I've watched um, one of the episodes. And I think, and then I've read a lot of the things that the producers um, and the creators of it, the intention was to start a dialogue about suicide and suicide prevention. And I honor the, the intention. I, I could not recommend it to probably anyone. And when I was reading, um, they were recommending it to children as young as 11 and 12 with parental, you know, parents watching with them. And I honestly cannot, and I can't understand a world in which we would want a 12 or 13 year old exactly. to watch someone actually kill themselves yeah. on screen as it happens. I, or a graphic rape. I don't understand that, and so I cannot recommend it. And um, if a teenager is determined to watch it, and you know, whatever, I, I wouldn't watch it alone. I would watch it with adults. And there are so many things that have been written since it first came out. Of, um, for instance, at our uh, seventh and eighth grade, our junior high um, worship services two weeks ago, they did. A, they never mentioned the Netflix series, but they did a series called 13 Reasons for Hope." And so they just, they countered it rather than saying, oh, you should not watch this, don't watch this. They didn't go at it that way. Instead, they took it from the viewpoint of understanding that teenagers are vulnerable and, um, and that they need to know why they should live. They need to know why they should hold on. And so they, they went at it from the viewpoint of, here are 13 reasons for hope in your life and in this world. And uh, that's available on YouTube if anybody wanted to, to, to see that. So my opinion is I honor the, the desire to have a great conversation, but I cannot recommend mm. the series. There was a high school that did the same thing in the Midwest somewhere that got a uh, high school and middle school that got 13 kids to talk every morning uh, to record something about their struggle and their reasons for hope. And they played it over the loudspeaking system mm. School began, and what they won it. Some of the kids, this was on NPR, some of the kids said it changed the way I was viewing the school. And the other thing that happened was the kids who were usually late for school got there every morning. So they to hear school. that, mm -hmm. uh, it's great. And so that kind of that the counter to that uh, was just crucial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me make I ask a question. Uh, kind of the question is uh, there are a lot of parallels in part of my story in a different way. I have a son named Matthew, but it was his dad who was in two very serious clinical depressions following me. And I can speak from experience and a couple of the things that, that I didn't hear you quite say, but I'm sure you've heard them say, said to you is that at the depth of the despair, uh, and I wouldn't even at the depth of just whatever the hell it was, the two kinds of feelings that were most prevalent for me were, and it was always very suicide mediation kind of stuff, were uh, my family would be better off without me drain sucking the blood and spirit out of the family, which was of course an illusion. And the other one was 
um, I'm just so tired. It's not like that I want to kill myself, I just don't want this to go on. Right. Okay, it was like a sense of kind of relief. So I know that sometimes when I've heard people talk about others, uh, or that they gave up and they committed suicide as if that was thing, what I had to say sometimes is no, that's not what's happening. They were just so blasted tired and they didn't see no way out. Thank, thank you. You know, maybe that's something that other people know here, but thank you so much for sharing that with me because mm -hmm. I, I have heard that from many people. And Matthew, because he lived with chronic suicidality from the time he was 12 until he died at 27, we had more conversations than I could count of, of us talking through the, the despair, the fatigue, the, the hopelessness. So many, many times I heard him say, similar to what you're saying, um, and many who've, uh, that I've talked to since have, have shared that as well. And um, yeah, when people, s it's a very common thing for people to think my family would be better off without my drama, without my, my uh, yeah, I'm a drain, you know, on the family. And when I can, I love to be able to just as gently as I can to just say, I know that it seems that your family would be better off. I hear that. I could see why that feels like a very logical decision to you. Um, but as, um, as a mom, I'm definitely not better off uh, yeah. without Matthew. He, I think part of it was the way that he had to get himself in a certain frame of mind to be able to take his life. He had to convince himself that he knew I would grieve. He said, you would grieve the most, Mom, and then Dad, and then his siblings, and then a few other people. But he said, really, within a short space of time, people will go on with their lives. What he didn't understand is that um, the ripples, you know, if, if his death was a ripple in a pond, those ripples just continue to enlarge and get bigger and bigger so that some of his friends will still tell me, I may never get over Matthew's death. I think about him every day, they'll say. He had no idea the impact that his death would have. None of us really do. Hmm. And... Um, so I do my best to just very gently, without guilt, without shame, just to show that that is, it's a distorted way of thinking. Um, the one about being so tired, man, I heard that. In fact, one of my favorite videos that encapsulates for those of us who might not live with that level of depression is a video, a music video by the group 10th Avenue North, and it's called WORN, W-O-R-N. It, I, I weep every time I watch it because he puts on film for us to see what it's like to live with that kind of fatigue that you think, I don't want to die, but I can't fight another day. And when you watch it, you see the subtle signs of hope beginning to build. It's not one of those videos that, you know, they tie it up at the end with a nice bow and make it all pretty. It's a painful video, but it explains in ways that sometimes we don't know how to say to other people. Um, and, oh, I had a thought. <laughs> Let me think for just a second. It was about that that was, that felt like it was important to say there. Um, okay, it really was worth saying, I think. <laughs> It'll come back to me in a second. It was about being tired. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. It's, I really... You, you alluded to that sometimes people say that suicide is the chicken way out. It's, you know, it's, it's for weaklings. It's for people who were, you know, not brave. No, 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 no. You need to understand that some of the bravest people who walk this earth are people who choose day after day after day to get up one more time, swing their legs over the edge of the bed, get out of that bed, and face life again. Some of the bravest people you will ever meet are people who live with severe depression, are people who, um, who you know, it's really easy. John was talking about in his church, you know, and we all do the happy, happy stuff at church. But the people who love Jesus and follow him when it never feels good, when it never feels good, we all have periods where it doesn't feel good, but where it, it just never feels good, and they just keep choosing one more day to live, one more day to trust, one more day to hope the thing. Such courage. 
So you, my friend, I can't see you where you are, but you, you are a courageous man. And I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you for your work. Um, when you were telling Matthew's story, you said that um, he lived with mental illness most of his life. I think we have a fairly good understanding and experience with young adult onset, with teenage onset. Could you just speak a little bit to childhood onset of mental illness? Thank you for bringing that up because um, half of all mental illness um, it shows up before age 14. So um, Matthew was depressed when he was seven, and he would have been diagnosed sooner, except for I didn't know that children could have yeah. mental illness. He probably could have been diagnosed at three or four. I just didn't know. Um, and so with smaller children, of course, it can be harder to, de to decide, as it is, of course, when somebody's older, it's much easier to check off little boxes. Oh, they show this, they show this, they show this, whatever. But um, for him, like with depression, it was, um, he just came home and said from school, just kept saying, I'm sad. And uh, when I would try to figure out, did you have a fight with somebody at school? Did you get in trouble? The answer was always no, no. But then when I would talk to his teacher, he'd lost interest in playing. He'd lost interest in playing on the playground. He'd lost, he lost interest at home in playing. Um, with his friends, with his games, with his toys, with his video games, that just all the things that, that drew him out and were part of who he was, um, he lost interest in. Um, food didn't matter that much to him. Um, his started, he started sleeping um, much more than he had been sleeping. So sometimes it's not enough sleep, sometimes it's too much sleep, sometimes it's eating too much, sometimes not eating enough. Um, losing interest over a period of weeks or months. I mean, everybody can have, we had just moved and so I attributed his sadness to the fact that we had moved. And um, so it took me a while to realize that this was not going away. He was continuing to feel this way. So over a period of weeks you know, to a month, um, it can be irritability, it can be um, sadness, it can be aggression, you know, changes. When you start seeing changes in somebody you love, um, negative changes that don't go away after a period of weeks, it's time to start paying attention. Mm -hmm. If it's a child, or a teenager, or an adult, or yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you, you, you the mental health professional, you add there. No, I have nothing to add, that's absolutely right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dave, and I'm sorry. For I don't see you yet, where, where are you? Just here. Oh, there, all right, thank you. I, I'm really sorry for it. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, I have spastic cerebral palsy, and I know not as much as some of us, but enough about self-loathing. And scripture is always a touchstone for me. And one of the verses that occurred to me while you were talking was, I think it's in Ephesians, where Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. What do you, how do you interpret that verse in light of your grief? In light of what I was saying. Um, I, um, well, first of all, I think God's big enough to handle any emotion in a human being he created and endowed with emotions. God is an emotional God, and he created us as in his image, so we have emotions as well. And um, I think that it's safe to express our emotions to God. Matthew got very angry at God. He also, he also had OCD. My goodness, that poor kid. He had so many things wrong. And in his OCD, he got to the place that he couldn't tell the difference between if it was the Holy Spirit talking to him or if it was his OCD telling him to do something. And he, his was always around religious things. Like, I need to go. I have to go talk to that person about Jesus. I have to. I'm the only person on the planet today who can talk to that person. I have to. And he got so confused as to whether, did the Holy Spirit just tell him to do that? Or was that his OCD um, talking to him? And so because he couldn't distinguish sometimes what the difference was, at the end, he got very angry at God. And when he died, he actually was pretty angry, estranged from God, um, feeling like God was his best friend, but God let him down. And it was so painful. And we didn't, I used to try to talk him out of it you know, provide all the logical answers to this, this, or this, to whatever his issues were of a moment. And I finally just learned that he needed more than anything, me just to sit with him and listen and um, cry with him and say often, 
Buddy, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. All I know is that God is good and I trust him. But I don't have an answer for that. And I think that when we express our emotions to God, whether it's anger, um, disappointment, um, sadness sometimes that our lives haven't turned out necessarily the way we expected them to, that, that God can handle that. And I had said earlier um, to John that I, I really believe that we need to run to God with those emotions, not away from. I think if we run to God with them, I don't see, I can't see where there's sin in that. I think when we take our anger and our sadness and our disappointment and even our bitterness and we run the opposite direction from God, there I can see sin. Um, but running to him with what we're feeling, what we're experiencing, I, I'm not going to get any comfort from God if I'm running the opposite direction. But if I'm running to him with my anger and my frustration and my pain and my sadness and my sorrow, I at least have the opportunity that somewhere as I'm running to him, he's going to be able to comfort me in some way and give me strength. So that's the way I've looked at that. I think, I think that particular verse is more about human relationships, um, but I think that the, it has a parallel there in our walk with God as well. So we've got time probably for one, maybe two more questions. I think there's one just there. Hi. I think if we were more willing to um, do the, that around that acrostic of being a place where uh, people are welcome with their whole selves, church should be the safest place on earth. Church should be the place where you don't have to whisper anything about your lives. Um, I talked about being an advocate for people with HIV and the, the whispering that people did because it wasn't safe to say it. And now where people are whispering to me about their mental illness, it's the same thing. People should never have to whisper anything about their lives at church. We all struggle. Let's not struggle alone. Let's struggle together. If it's with mental illness, if it's with um, an anger problem, if it's um, an addiction, if it's a hurt or a habit or a hang up that you don't know what to do with, you can't seem to get past it, we all struggle. So let's struggle together. And so I really see, um, I, I love the church. I love the church of Jesus Christ. Um, I, you know, the Bible talks about the church being a bride. And sometimes I think the bride's dress is torn and dirty. <laughs> you know, she's gotten a scuffle on the way to, to, to the wedding. Um, so the church has a lot of things to answer for, and one of them is not being a safe place for people with their whole selves, with whatever they're struggling, wherever they're hurting, wherever they're not finding the relief that they need, the help that they need, the comfort that they need, the, the acceptance that they need. Um, we did an event at our church a couple weeks ago. We called it Hope Rising. In fact, what John read was um, the opening part of an email that we sent out to people that just said, if you are living with a Ill mental illness, we want you to come to our church on May 19th. And um, it's by people, for people, with, through people living with mental illness. So if you're singing on the stage, you're saying, I'm living with a mental illness. If you're hosting it, you're saying, I'm living. If you're a table leader, you're saying, I'm living with mental illness. If you're attending, you're saying. So you don't have to, so we had 300 people. So in other words, if this were, if you were that group of people, each one of you would be able to look around at everybody else and not have to go, is he, does she? Because you would just know everybody. So everybody there, and it was the most amazing time. And people saying, I've never, ever felt this safe at church to talk about my life, to talk about my mental illness. And it breaks my heart. This is a really long answer, and I'm sorry. It breaks my heart that, that there are people who feel like they cannot bring themselves and their mental illness and whatever it, whatever it causes in their lives, whatever disruption it causes, they, they can't come to church. Um, it's like I want to go find them and bring them and go, no, 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 come here, come here, come here. This is a safe place for you. But I don't think it's that far-fetched. 
I really think we can do it. I think we can do it. We can be that. Fantastic. Okay, we can only thank you for your time and for mm. your ministry, for your honesty, and for changing our lives a little bit this evening. Mm. So we're very, very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you.